Well, it's indeed an honor to be here today. It's, it's wonderful to see all of you. It, it shows what's happening in the globalization of, of technology. And I thought I would talk a bit today about the Silicon Valley recipe uh, because Silicon Valley, as you know, is, is really no longer a place. It's a concept. It's a concept that we see being deployed throughout the world in, in so many exciting places. And quite frankly, it is still growing and it is still vibrant uh, in intensity. Uh, I was fortunate uh, almost five decades ago to start a law firm here with, at the time, when there were less than five of us, and today over 725 lawyers serving 3,000 private companies and 400 public companies. And what's interesting is all of the elements that we develop to really foster the commercialization of technology has remained the same uh, and has remained consistent. Now, clearly, the Valley has been a success. You know that. Uh, there are over 10,000 companies here employing over one million people. Um, and uh, the wealth of some of these companies uh, has been geometric, over $1.5 trillion in market cap. But that, none of that is really the end game. All of this is about commercializing technology, fostering innovation, and creating things that lead, frankly, to better lives. And what we're doing in life sciences, in nanotechnology, in the Internet of Things, in cloud computing and mobility and transparency, it is, it, it, it is getting even more exciting and more dynamic. And the fact that all of you are here today uh, is, is an output of all of that dynamic growth because it's happening in Europe and in Israel and in China and Asia and other countries. But frankly, there is a recipe to all of this. And if all the parts are not there, it really doesn't foster growth as much as it can and as much as it can achieve. And so I thought I would talk to you about the key elements of the recipe and why it all works and how it ties together. So the first element, of course, the first element of the brew, so to speak, is an entrepreneurial culture. And, and all of you, uh, in one form or another, are entrepreneurs. But what does that really mean in the technology industry? Well, it has several elements to it. One an element, of course, is uh, the reliance so much on diversity. It doesn't matter about gender, race, color, creed, education, where you live, who you belong to, or what you wear. It's all about the, the individual. Secondly, uh, it means that failure uh, is not a stigma. It's, it's a learning process. It's only an experience. Uh, it also means that the entrepreneur really focuses on meritocracy. It's a performance-based culture, time to market, innovation, uh, real-time development. It's also entrepreneurial in the sense of the relationship of how companies are put together. Uh, the emphasis upon equity compensation, cheap stock, tax advantage stock options instead of cash compensation. It's characterized by the willingness to take risk. And what's very interesting, uh, the term sheets that we designed when I was working with people like Bob Noyce, who started Intel, or even Steve Jobs when we took Apple public in 1980, is that they haven't changed. Uh, there are still no long-term employment contracts. There are no, not any long-term agreements between investors and entrepreneurs. It's based on an element of trust. It's based upon a symbiotic balance of mission and goal and entrepreneurialism. And so it's very important that that aspect be identified, that entrepreneurial culture where there's lateral movements among companies, where it's okay to go to work for Hewlett Packard for two years to leave to do a startup. And that's the key element. The second key element is access to capital. And you heard Julie talk about that. Access to capital is critical and it's changing. It's changing dramatically. Uh, of course, we have now a variety of providers of capital. Uh, we have angel investors, wealthy individuals in technology who are willing to do startups. We have micro venture firms. 
that focus on key verticals such as life science or cloud computing. We have the traditional venture firms. We have over 800 of them in managing over $200 billion, averaging about $25 billion of investment a year. Uh, and, and the important thing to understand about venture capital is the element of trust and the fact that they provide more than money. They provide mentoring, they provide management, they help recruiting, they help develop marketing, they work on strategies. It takes more than, than raw capital. So you have this entrepreneurial culture and this entrepreneurial spirit. Now you've got this capital, but it's expanding. Now we have private equity, firms that really used to focus on buyouts, leverage buyouts of big companies have now decided to invest in private companies, have decided to uh, take minority positions in private companies, and, and you see some major financings going on. Uh, you know, we've done doing financings for companies like uh, Airbnb or Uber or even Tesla, where you have uh, hundred million, two hundred million dollar checks being written to scale companies. So the diversification of capital has really been a very, very key element of, of the whole success of the recipe. Now the other part of the recipe, of course, deals with access to technology. And there are the sources of technology are very important. Uh, and they really come a lot from the universities. It's really important to understand the role of the university in the United States in supporting the technology industry. We're very fortunate here in uh, the Valley to have such great institutions as Berkeley, Stanford, UCSF, Santa Clara. But these schools adopt policies that support the Silicon Valley recipe. For example, uh, they have a commitment to be sure that they don't harbor pure research. Uh, they are, have very liberal technology licensing policies. Um, when, when Larry and Sergey came to see me in 1998 to incorporate Google, all of the concept they had, all of the thinking and the algorithms, they developed as graduate students at Stanford and we were able to commercialize that and start a company without any major obstacle. The willingness to partner with technology is important by the universities. They run entrepreneurial programs, intellectual property programs, um, sponsorship programs. So that has been a very key element of this. And I must admit, uh, it, it's not necessarily always the case in other parts of Europe. I remember giving a speech uh, about 15 years ago in Cambridge and talking about the policies at Cambridge about technology and the interest they had in these very innovative forward-looking ways of commercializing technology out of the schools, out of the universities. And we in the United States are, are still developing that. Uh, we now see institutions like Cornell, MIT, and other great institutions that are trying to emulate this commercialization of technology out of the graduate students. And it's, it's been very key. The other source of technology that's been very important to this recipe are the forward-looking corporations. Without companies uh, in the early days like IBM, Hewlett Packard, and today Cisco, Oracle, Google, uh, and many, many others, they play an important role to the entrepreneurialism and the growth of enterprises. Uh, they're a breeding ground for future management because one of the key asset, perhaps the key asset in the success of all of the companies I've represented is not the vision necessarily, it's not the business plan, it's the people. A committed top entrepreneurial team can take an average business plan and make it a success. An unmotivated management team that is not entrepreneurial can take the greatest idea in the world and fail with it. And the breeding ground for that talent comes out of these corporations. In addition, these corporations are willing to invest capital. They enter into strategic alliance, commercial agreements, and that's been an important key. So now you've got the entrepreneurial culture. You have the access to diverse capital. You've got the sources of technology. 
the compatibility of universities and large corporations. And then you've got to look at government support. Government support and government policy is very, very important to developing a success like Silicon Valley. It's critical because there's a unique balance between regulation and a free market. You, without regulation, there's no such thing as a free market. And government forward policies, tax policy, research and development policy, the willingness to invest uh, in companies, uh, in representing Tesla, uh, Elon and I went to the government, the Department of Energy in the United States, and received a half a billion dollar loan on good terms to really help jumpstart the production of the Model S. A government that balances antitrust and patent philosophy and privacy and security is very, very important. You can overregulate the entrepreneur and kill innovation. Uh, you can underregulate and result in chaos. And that balance is very important. And another part of it is business ethics and business integrity. Without trust, without the protection of trade secrets, without the protection of confidential information, without rules about how to solicit employees from a competitor, without a business ethics, this house, this recipe starts to fall apart. And I've seen that, quite frankly, in some other countries where I have gone to lecture and talk about representing companies and where internal corruption just slows it all down, just destroys the momentum. And that's one thing that is very, very important. And that's why it's great that we are coming together to share ideas uh, on regulation, on privacy, on security, on protecting assets, because that's a key part of the element. Of course, the development of law is critical, and we see that um, ever-changing. Today, our technologies are disruptive, you know, and, and our businesses are so different today. Uh, you know, Airbnb rents more rooms but owns no real estate. Uber is the largest taxi service in the world that doesn't own any cars. Google makes information ubiquitous and it's for free. And the list goes on. So it is a different paradigm today. It really is what I refer to as a digital, virtual, virtual mobile, transparent world. And regulation has to keep up with it. And, and that is a constant tension. And that requires an openness of policy it requires communication from the private sector to the government sector. It requires entrepreneurs such as yourselves to be a part of policy setting in any way you can, and, and that's important. The other key element to the success, of course, are liquidity events. There has to be an exit strategy in order to have access to capital. And uh, the main exit strategies in the United States have been the initial public offering, the IPO, and the merger or the acquisition. But that too is very, very dynamic, very dynamic. You know, prior to uh, the financial crisis in 2008, we were averaging, you know, over 120, 150 IPOs a year out of the technology sector. Since then, it's down under 50. I remember when we used to do IPOs and raise just $50 million. There's no such thing as a $50 million IPO in the United States anymore. They're, they're, they have to be at least a couple hundred million. Uh, the timing has changed for the IPO. We used to be able to take companies public uh, within five years of startup. Today that has doubled and it's getting longer. And the reason is the world's more complex, technology is more global, Scale is more difficult. Capital is more intense. The human equation is becoming more competitive. And so building a company today really does take a disruptive view of all of the pieces. And, and being public is not an end game. Uh, it, it really is only a tool or a tactic to build scale. It's a way of developing a currency to do other things, to incentivize employees, to get your investors liquid so new capital can come into new startups. 
And that balance is very important. And the reason why it works is the importance of a very transparent and liquid capital market. One of the great, great assets of the United States when it comes to innovation and commercialization of technology is the quality and regulation of its capital markets. It's something that gets intense scrutiny, and it needs to get intense scrutiny. Because without a vibrant market that you can trust, that's liquid and can adjust, you won't have access to capital. And without access to capital, you won't fuel your vision or your entrepreneurialism, and things start to collapse. So again, it's a, it's a major, major balance. And lastly, the last key element uh, is the infrastructure of Silicon Valley. You have to build infrastructure. You need to have the support services. We can get a technology enterprise building up in a matter of months now. We are not bogged down in city permits, environmental laws. Those are all very important, but they now have been digitized. Speed is critical. We must make government adjust to the demands and movement of technology. Otherwise, you can't get these facilities up. Something as simple as that. Something as simple as regulating traffic. You need the accounting firms. You need the investment banking firms. You need the law firms. And they all have to be in tune with this recipe. They are a key parts of the symbiotic relationship. So these are the, the elements. An entrepreneurial culture, focused so much on diversity and risk-taking, but yet built upon quality of character and ethics, access to capital that's diverse, access to sources of technology, the interplay of the universities and the corporations, which is so important, government policy, which is fundamentally key, transparent and fluid markets, which is essential, and all of the infrastructure. And I must tell you, I'm very excited about where we are, and I'm very excited for you. We find that we are doing more and more transactions cross-border and with Europe. There's going to be an integration of our technology efforts and our technology companies. Uh, every technology company of scale today is a global company, and I'm fortunate to represent some of the most successful of them. Uh, the time that I'm even spending in Europe uh, is critical as we work together and solve some of our differences in regulation, in capital markets, in government policy, in diversity, and in, you know, the way we do formation of enterprises. It's a very, very exciting time. Uh, I think that globalization is the key to the future scalability uh, of, our, of our companies. And I do think that we are a bit in the infancy of what's going on at this next technology wave. I was fortunate to be practicing in the 70s when it was all about semiconductors. And then in the 80s when we started computer companies like Apple and Sun Microsystems and so many others. And then what happened in the 90s uh, with companies like Netscape and then life science companies and of course what happened with the internet, we keep changing the technology, but these fundamental elements that I've talked about do not change. They remain the same, uh, and we have to constantly reinforce them, and I'm very proud of the diversity that we have in Silicon Valley with o over 60 different languages spoken here, because globalization is the key thing. So I'm very excited to be here to address you briefly. I'm very excited for you. You're going to have a great week. I welcome you um, here. I want you to soak in all you can and build great companies. And uh, perhaps we will meet again uh, uh, on, on a different continent to talk about the success of the future. Thank you.